Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and or good morning, depending on the time zone that you are in. Uh, my name is Wasim Jabi. I am a professor of computational methods in architecture at the Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff University. And it is a pleasure for me to introduce to you our guest speaker for this afternoon, uh, Matthias Del Campo. Matthias is a registered architect, designer, and educator. He is an associate professor at the Taubman School of Architecture and Urban Planning, University of Michigan, my alma mater. And he's also director of the AR2IL. I don't know how you, how you pronounce it, but that's, that's the acronym for it. The Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory uh, at the University of Michigan. And he is also an affiliate faculty member uh, of Michigan Robotics, Computer Science and Data Sciences. And he is also the co-founder of the Architectural Practice Span, which is actually how I met him because in my book back in 2013, uh, I was looking for innovative projects that use parametric design and computational methods. Uh, and I stumbled on the work of Matthias and Sandra and I invited them to um, submit their project and interview them and include them in the book. So you can find them in that, in that uh, chapter in the book. Um, Today, uh, I will let him, of course, introduce uh, the topic, but in general, we are talking about AI and how it relates to architecture and to design. So without further ado, uh, I will introduce to you, uh, Matthias. It's all yours, Matthias. Uh, thank you very much, Vasim, for this really generous introduction. Um, um, and also, uh, maybe retrospectively, thank you for the invitation to your book back then. This was an important point for us uh, to do this, and it helped us a lot. Uh, so really highly appreciate it. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, uh, neural architecture design and artificial intelligence, uh, which is basically um, a collection of some thoughts, ideas, and concepts that um, that I put together in the book Neural Architecture, which was recently published uh, with Oro Editions. Um, so the book came about because uh, I mean, Sandra and I have been uh, working on and off uh, about the topic of AI since the late 90s, uh, when we met the people from the Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory uh, at um, uh, in Vienna. And from then, sort of occasionally, we thought about it, and it started to intensify in the last five to six years when we noticed that new algorithms came about, which are really useful for our work. Uh, at this point, I would like to say thank you to Mario Carpo for the amazing introduction that he wrote for the book. Um, the book itself presents itself rather as an opportunity to interrogate uh, AI and neural networks in architectural design through the lens of theory, I would say, rather than a, a practical application. So it's not sort of like a manual, it's more um, a contemplation about how do things influence us as designers, how they influence the results we produce. There's a variety of examples in here about, for example, in the Valley of the Hallucinating Machines is the name of one's chapter that actually deals with the concept that machines have learned from humans, or there is basically concepts that derive from neuroscience about how we, for example, dream or hallucinate as humans and how we can translate that into mathematics and encapsulate that uh, in, in an algorithm. Uh, there's also considerations about the term style, for example, because it's it was really funny for me to learn how, um, how, for example, neuroscientists talk about or, or computer scientists talk about style very differently than we as architects do. Uh, there is not that heavy history that is on our shoulders as architects from the 20th century. They, they, they have a far more a, a relaxed approach to the problem of style. And I thought it's interesting to observe through, the, through their eyes how that influences us as architects. Uh, then uh, uh, conceptualizing a, uh, the idea whether machines can learn to plan. I mean, we're talking here about learning systems in general, um, and and ultimately the book closes with a chapter on the politics uh, of AI and architecture, um, particularly thinking about data set building, the way how it influences how these results influence your results, right, as designers. And because of, for example, how data sets are very biased these days towards Western architecture, it of course will, will uh, prefer 
creating Western architecture. So, so there's no, there's very little diversity currently in those data sets. And we at the laboratory are, are working on this problem at the moment, uh, trying to create diverse data sets that will inform architecture in a more inclusive way. So uh, what is neural architecture? I mean, neural architecture is the field of architecture that is primarily preoccupied with interrogating the emergent field of artificial neural networks as a method of designing architecture. Artificial neural networks can be described in short as a sequence of mathematical algorithms that are capable of registering latent correlations in a set of data. In this lecture, I present an attempt to utilize deep learning and machine learning to capture the salient features of existing architecture in order to interrogate this data for their underlying architectural qualities. What is meant by underlying architectural qualities? The rational explanation would include aspects such as spatial layout, sectional distribution of volumes, the dialogue with its environment, the volumetric balance, the material qualities of the design, the structural properties, and so on and so forth. All of these things can be explored with the help of machine learning processes. However, the ambition of, uh, of the projects in this lecture maintain that architecture is more than just an assemblage of, of rational properties. Uh, this might also explain the obsession with neural art, which represents an excellent mirror of contemporary age, particularly regarding our shared agency with quasi-intelligent machines and their observation of the world. Can architecture do the same? Can neural networks help interrogate the latent layers within the geological deposits of the history of the architecture discipline and then assemble those found features into, into unseen designs? What is the context of which this idea emerged? But most importantly, why use AI in general? There's a short answer. It's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. It's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. Okay, so what is meant by that? You might have seen videos like the ones you see on the screen right now, which basically represent the way of how cars were created in the vast majority of the 20th century, or at least very much until the late 60s and early 70s, you had like a set of experts putting together elements and, and providing and applying their expertise, for example, in welding or polishing, or really creating the, the whole frame uh, or creating the parts of the car that assemble that to a complete piece or the complete car. Uh, you see that it's a lot of people are necessary for that. A lot of people have to learn a particular expertise to do this. Um, and it needs, of course, um, resources, time, and energy. In 1967, um, General Motors introduced for the first time the use of an industrial robot on an assembly line in a factory in New Jersey. It was the Unimate uh, uh, industrial robot. Uh, and from then on, this became a success story, so it was applied all over the world to create those assembly lines where robots weld together cars. How, do, how does this work? Well, basically somebody has to train a robot about the particular welding points of a specific car model. And everyone who has worked with a robot knows that there's a pendant that allows you to literally teach a robot particularly moves in space and then program it to weld, in this case, for example, some of the points. This also means that the car industry has collected several million data points uh, about welding points in space over the decades it has been using robots, which of course represents an enormous repository of data that is actually uh, possible to get used to train machines, not to weld particular points in space that are teached, but to learn what welding is and what good welding is. The big advantage of a learning system specifically with the example of the assembly line here, is that uh, you don't have to train a robot anymore to, to, to do specific welding points for a specific car model. Using machine vision, uh, the car parts come along, the machine will look at them and understand, oh, I know where to weld this and understand where these points are and then weld those pieces together. The big advantage is also that you don't have to retrain the machine over and over again, meaning that every single car that comes along that assembly line can be a different car model and it still would work. Now for something a little bit different, which is the rise of neural art. 
you might have, you, you probably know this uh, painting here. Uh, it's the portrait of uh, Monte Bellamy uh, by the Paris-based art collective Obvious, which was sold at Christie's in 2018 for almost half a million dollars. It is, was allegedly the first entirely AI-generated piece of art. I think this is going to be up to some historians in the future to define that. But the name itself, Ed Monte Bellamy, seems to be a tribute to the inventor of the generative adversarial network, Ian Goodfellow. Uh, Bellamy, Goodfellow. But more importantly than the price that it fetched, I think, are the, are the questions that this piece of art basically threw onto the scene. Questions like, who is the author in this case? Yeah, The art collective that came up with using this particular algorithm to create a piece of art, the programmer who actually coded the algorithm, or is it the artists in the, in the data set, hundreds, maybe thousands of artists uh, that were present in the data set used to create this piece of art? Who has the copyright of something that was not created by humans? The rise of neural art became very visible after 2018, when artists such as Sofia Crespo, Mario Klingemann, Memo Akten embraced the use of AI as a legitimate form of artistic expression. And it cannot be reduced to the visual arts alone. Musicians, neural musicians such as Holly Herndon, Arca, Yacht and Dadabots use AI to make their, their music. And one of the earliest adopters of neural networks to create works of art is actually literature. And uh, about the same time when Sandra and I started to learn about this artist, we were also working on, on, on similar um, uh, concepts, creating data sets, for example, in this case of Gothic architecture, and then uh, um, doing latent walks with those that with the data in order to interrogate the space uh, between known data points for things that we didn't know yet or haven't seen before. But it also it, it raised the same questions that the artist has about agency, authorship, and sensibility in a post-human design ecology. What is the architect's role in a context where the sole authorship is not in the human anymore, but when agency is shared? Uh, what you see here are some examples of uh, first attempts to create plans uh, and sections uh, using neural networks. This was done in 2018, I think. Uh, same problem again, um, creating a data set um, uh, and, and starting to use neural style transfer, or no, in this case, it was actually StyleGun, a StyleGun 2 algorithm uh, to interrogate that space um, in the data set that is not known to us. Uh, and thus might be able to provide us with some provocative, uh, different, um, maybe even strange uh, plan solutions that we can then take as a cue for further development of ideas in architecture. And I, I mentioned the term strange. And some things that we have been exploring for a while now are the, um, uh, the, the concepts of estrangement and defamiliarization. There's a whole set of uh, thinkers that already um, started to, to discuss this topic, like Viktor Shlovsky, Bert Brecht, Sigmund Freud. Um, uh, Viktor Shlovsky's concept of Ostranini uh, is basically the same like estrangement. But what, what does it do? Defamiliarization or Ostranini, um, which was basically termed in 1917 by the Russian formalist Viktor Shlovsky uh, in his famous article, Art is Technique, describes an artistic method that provokes the audience with imagery depicting everyday things in unfamiliar or strange ways. The goal is to provide the audience with the opportunity to gain new perspectives and observe the world through a different lens through techniques that introduce abstraction into the aesthetics of realism. And the concept was highly influential in the 20th century in art and art theory, and included uh, it influenced things like Dada, postmodernism, epic theater, science fiction, and philosophy. More recently, it has been also uh, used by um, uh, uh, protagonists of culture jamming. Um, 
as I mentioned, there's a whole history to this concept. So um, Hegel already discussed uh, estrangement uh, to a certain extent, Karl Marx, uh, Viktor Shlovsky, I mentioned already, uh, Bert Brecht. You probably could also add H.P. Um, Lovecraft to that list. Bert Brecht uh, is a famous German uh, theater director um, who famously used uh, estrangement to in his plays to make the, the, the spectator aware about the artific artificiality of the theater. Uh, so he was not uh, thinking about using theater as an, as an illusion, um, uh, but rather really wanted it. So it, it was not supposed to be immersive, an immersive experience but rather than an experience that talks intellectually to the observer instead of visually. Or, yes, it also was visually, but only to a, to a different extent. And uh, I think you cannot uh, thoroughly interrogate the topic of estrangement and depolarization without mentioning Sigmund Freud. Uh, Sigmund Freud wrote an essay called Das Unheimliche, The Uncanny, uh, where Freud defines the uncanny as deeply rooted in what is known to individuals as common or familiar. And that is what I, what I think is an interesting thought in architecture, where we have to deal with aspects that are uh, in a per se always familiar, but at the same time, we're trying to push the envelope of what artistically and conceptually is possible in architecture. This is an image that I like to show as an example of what I mean by this uh, um, estrangement in architectural design that comes along with the use of artificial intelligence. So this is an image that I created in Midjourney uh, somewhere in maybe June this year. And it, um, it talks to the concept of the estrangement in very clear terms in that it has a variety of features that we architects immediately recognize as profoundly architectural features the long band windows, the, the rectangular quality of the space. Um, so it has a it, it has a, a sort of modern slash brutalist vibe to it. Yeah. But at the same time, so there is, as I say, there's also like an, a stylistic conversation going on here. But at the same time, uh, there are things happening here which uh, elude our complete perception. So, for example, what's happening between the ground and, and the volume on top of it? Is it growing out of the ground? Is it carved into the ground? How does it really communicate to the ground as a building? Uh, it's, it's almost like dissolving into the ground. And then the same happens also when it comes to the sky. Is this erosion? Is this broken? Is this intentionally designed like this? Uh, so these are all questions that evoke our, our attention. And that's exactly what estrangement does. It combines familiar features with elements that are uh, that provoke us uh, to, to look twice, so to speak, or you know, they evoke it attention. And that attention, of course, um, uh, results in a reflection about what we see uh, in terms of uh, building design. In my opinion, um, uh, neural architecture or the use of AI in architecture is the first genuinely 21st century design method. Uh, why do I say that? Um, if you think about it, the vast majority of the computational design methods that we that are common and used, such as parametric, uh, parametric modeling, agent-based modeling, scripting, versioning, blobs, folds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are all methods that were developed in the late 20th century and that were uh, refined in the last 20, 22 years. Uh, they, 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 and they have come to fruition and are really ripe now. But what we see currently happening Neural architecture is, is a new paradigm, not only intellectually and culturally, but also technically. What we see today was not yet possible even a decade ago. And I'm going to give you some examples maybe to, um, to solidify that position. Uh, the Robot Garden uh, was a commission that Span got from the University of Michigan, from the robotics department. Um, and basically what it is, is that the, the robotics department built a new building on the North Campus in Michigan, and uh, they needed a testing ground for their robots. And they already knew that um, we were working on a variety of design methods based on machine vision and a variety of other neural networks. Uh, because, of course, we also were working with one of the PhD students from Michigan Robotics, uh, Alexander Carlson. Uh, on all these methods. So the, the department came with the idea and say, okay, if you can do this, can you do the testing ground for our robots based on basically principles that those robots are using, uh, meaning machine vision. 
and they said we it needs it has to have certain requirements so the requirements so were that uh, it needed a variety of different ground conditions uh, it needed steps um, so that's why you see like a variety of different ground conditions like gravel sand rocks um, and it needed also a, a series of poles around it uh, to mount a variety of uh, equipment necessary to control the experiments done on the site. So we actually combined several different methods to do this design. Uh, we used uh, neural style transfer, we used 2D to 3D style transfer, we used deep dreaming uh, in order to create the various elements of, this, of the project. So for example, for, for the deep dreaming, we made data sets about fountains, uh, steps and columns and a variety of other architectural features in order to let um, a neural network dream or deep dream those features into the site. Um, and the different ground conditions were achieved by creating a data set that has uh, thousands and thousands of satellite images of various ground conditions and then using that one um, for neural style transfer. The steps are necessary because they're testing the so-called last 100 step problem on this uh, particular uh, um, testing ground. The last 100 step problem basically says that if you want to have robots that can deliver goods to your door, uh, the most difficult part for the robot is the last 100 steps to your door. Because uh, if it has to go to a house, there might be different ground conditions. It can be earth, gravel, it can be concrete. So it has to learn how to master those different grounds. And the steps on the testing site were also necessary because very often those one family housing projects have steps when it, when they go to the uh, to the entrance and those steps can vary. Uh, so they, they needed something that has a variety of different uh, steps. This is a video that I really like a lot. Uh, previously in my lectures, I showed other videos of machine vision and how that looks like, uh, but I'm happy that the robotics department in Michigan provided me with this uh, video that basically shows how robots perceive the, the robot garden. Uh, and this is quite fascinating to me to see how different the way is that machines actually see the world to how we perceive the world. And here a quick image of the of a small section uh, of the of the data set of satellite images of ground. Uh, we did many, many attempts uh, in this in the development of this project uh, because the um, it was an early an early example of using neural networks for design in architecture. So um, we still needed to learn, I think, how to respond to to imagery that we get provided by the machines. Uh, some of those, like and this is one of my favorite ones actually from the whole series of tests that we did uh, regarding uh, creating those different ground conditions. This is one of my favorites because it's so different. It's so strange. It's so weird. It's so uh, provocative for me. And it's it also makes me think whether machines perceive architecture like this instead of how we see it. Let me talk about the... Um, omnipresent text-to-image um, generation algorithms. So if you even have people like John Oliver discussing mid-journey in his show, then it means that it has reached really the mainstream uh, of the human imagination. And that happened in just a couple of months. For me, that actually means to consider also what Wittgenstein said about language, if we talk about text to image generation, which means that the limit of my language means the limit of my world. We have a precursor to the currently so popular diffusion models in our work in that we, we actually used um, uh, an attentional generative adversarial network, an attentional GAN uh, as the basis for a project in 2020 uh, for the design of a high school project in Shenzhen, China. So attention uh, GAN can synthesize fine-grained details as different subregions of the image by paying attention to the re relevant words in the natural language description. In addition, a deep attention multimodal similarity model computes a fine-grained image text matching loss for training the generator. It is actually trained on the COCO dataset. A detailed analysis is also performed by visualizing the attention layers of the attentional GAN. 
And, and this project was also done before any diffusion came along um, that actually helped us with this and also uh, pre-GPT-3. So what you see here are the, the image pairs between a sentence that we gave that we input and the resulting image. And what we wanted to do was basically take parts of the program uh, that, the, that the competition asked for and then combine it with some, like give it a bit of a surreal twist, so to speak. So, for example, if you if in the program there's something like the gym has 2,000 square meters, has two base basketball fields, and uh, and changing rooms, we actually wrote exactly that. So it's 2,000 square meters. It's a uh, it's uh, it's a gym. It has two basketball courts, changing rooms, and it's standing on uh, yellow canary feet. So and that's actually what generated the imagery. We learned also in this process, in this project, uh, the combination between um, how do you take 2D imagery and basically create volumes out of them. And how this, basically what we did is we divided this into colored patches and then used Grasshopper basically to extrude those. It's what, it was a rather simple and crude process, but it was a starting point for us. And also what is important for us is that we learned that the algorithms cannot generate interior and exterior at the same time. So in this case, we developed the exterior with the algorithm and the interior was basically manual work. So in, AI does not always do everything on its own. There's still a lot of human work involved in, in, in architecture at least. Uh, early this year, um, January, something like January, February this year, I stumbled upon Disco Diffusion, um, which I found uh, in, a, in an art channel about visual art, uh, about uh, media art, actually. And uh, I immediately went on to work with this. And I, I, I really still like the videos that you can generate with uh, Disco Diffusion. For example, in this case, like endless plan plans, right? An endless plan generator. And what is interesting is how close um, these diffusion models are to very common techniques that we know as architects regarding how to process, how to progress making a project. So, for example, conventionally speaking, you would say that an architect that sits down with a pen and starts sketching a plan, for example, and we create various variations of those plans in order to come up with a solution for a specific architectural problem. Now. Um, the image you see here is another example where uh, this is from the Atelier Holland from 2004, which was studies for the Saturn Tower, which was built in Vienna, where you have uh, three, six, uh, 28 models, yeah? 28 variations, volumetric variations on what you could do on that side. So this idea of, of creating variations and iterations or iteratively approaching a problem is a very common technique in architecture. What diffusion models do is that they amplify that a lot. So uh, I, I did a little bit of math. Um, from April this year to August this year, I generated 75,000 images in mid-journey. Um, so you see that it, 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 this, sort of, this idea of variations explode. And I think it has also to do with the way of how Midjourney operates. You write a prompt, you get four images back, and then you can choose which one to continue iterating on or which one you want to uh, in, increase in size. Uh, and, and that's such a human element that they put in there. This, this element of selecting uh, is something really fascinating in Midjourney. Um, let me quickly explain how this how these diffusion models actually operate. Uh, is things like disco diffusion, stable diffusion, mid journey, DALI two. They all work the same way, and they have like a they have the same history, so to speak. And it all started with so called automated image capturing in two thousand fifteen. Now, what happened two thousand fifteen was that there were enough annotated images. For example, images that said, this is a dog, this is a car, this is a person, this is a chair, et cetera, et cetera. So individual annotated images of things. There were enough there that somebody came up with the idea and said, well, maybe we can train a neural network 
to uh, recognize the whole scene and create an automated caption of that image. So in this case, the caption that was automatically generated was people walking on a bridge because the neural network recognized all the different elements of this image, the people, the bridge, etc. <clears throat> Very quickly after this was discovered in 2015, somebody came up with the idea, well, what if we turn it around? What if I write people walking on a bridge and let the machine generate the image? So using it instead of using the, the algorithm analytically, it's using the algorithm generatively. And this person was Elman Mansinov and his colleagues at Amazon Web Services. They came up with this idea and they very quickly actually also uh, published a paper, uh, which was called uh, Generating Images from Captions with Attention. And it came out in 2016. And um, uh, I always forget, forget that I have to put another slide here between this one and the next one that I want to show, which actually shows the results that they achieved in 2016. Because they were doing things like uh, writing a prompt that says, uh, a red elephant is flying in the blue sky. Yeah, And the image that they generated when they were trying this for the first time was basically just a blue blotch with a red blotch in the middle. And if you squinted at your eyes, you could recognize something that could look similar to an elephant in red in there. That happened because the resolution was so small back then that you couldn't do anything that really looked sharp or, or good. But that's very often the case uh, in, in work with AI is that the, the first time things are tried, of course, the resolution is very low just to get it to work at all. What diffusion models actually do is they take the images in their data sets and then add noise to them repeatedly until it's a complete noise image. Yeah. Um, so basically, they take the information and they scramble that into into uh, into a um, into a random noise image. And then we reverse the process. We take the random noise and then, based on the uh, on the prompt, the pixels are organized to make a, a this, uh, make an image that makes sense. So in this case, the prompt was. Uh, an alpine an alpine modern villa yeah it might have been a bit longer but that's about what what happened here so it organizes the pixels then back into something that uh that looks like an uh, an image and um this process is getting better and better all the time it's also of course dependent on the size of the data set used behind it and the uh, disco diffusion no sorry uh, mid journey uses a data set called the lion data set l uh, e -O -N, the Lion data set that uh, currently has uh, 5 5.3 5 billion annotated images. So it's a huge data set that it's using to create the imagery. And more specifically, it also dives into the uh, Lion aesthetics data set, which has, I think, something like 230 million. So that's why Midjourney might have the tendency to create images that rather tend towards the artistic than the complete realistic one. Of course, this opens like all the doors for lazy architects yeah, who will be using this method to basically just imitate other architects. This is this is let's be let's be honest. This is exactly what's going to happen. So if you use a prompt like Mies van der Rohe building, it already can generate very convincingly looking results. So this is not a building that exists yet for Mies van der Rohe. This is what Midjourney generates when you prompt it. Yeah, but it can be very much a, a basis for a, an, like an imitation. Another interesting problem is what happens if you try to do plans and sections in these diffusion models. So this is a, a prompt that says section drawing for an opera house, which was generated on May 2nd this year. Of course, this is not the section for an opera house, but the interesting point for me is that it could become the, the starting point for the design of an opera house. So it's really a, a good tool for first impression, um, first inspirations for a design that you want to kick off with. Um, so it's really sort of like a, a, a discussion or, or dialogue between you as a designer and the enormous repositories of the human imagination that are present in the data sets that Midjourney is using. Uh, it also changes a lot uh, from version to version. So this is the same prompt section drawing through an opera house generated a couple of days ago using Midjourney version four. 
Now the progress is obviously visible. The plants are much sharper. They look much cleaner. Um, they are really beautiful. But at the same time, I think they're boring. The ones that it's generating now, because it it has become s sort of like the representation of a, of a historical idea of the opera, right? Um, it it is showing us so res resolved things that it's it. it um, I think it lacks the ability to provoke at least my imagination to go further with them. One of the interesting things also about these sections in Mid Journey is that they make no sense whatsoever. Uh, they, they look interesting, they look beautiful, so they can emulate the look of a graphic design that is basically a plan and a section, but because it does not have the semantic information in the data set that explains or that makes the machine learn, Where's the green room in the opera? Where's the back of house of the opera? What's this? Uh, how high is the stage tower? All those things are not present in the data sets. Thus, the machine cannot learn them. But it can create an image that is sort of the illusion of a section through an opera house. Another thing I had a lot of fun with is this prompt here: the most beautiful house in the world. So this was prompted on May 2nd, 2022, using the version two of Mid Journey. And for Mid Journey at that point in time, the most beautiful house in the world was this here. When I see this sort of imagery, yeah, we can debate that, whether this is really the most beautiful house in the world. The same prompt, the most beautiful house in the world, Mid Journey version four, just a couple of days ago. If this is the most beautiful house in the world, I don't think that architects will get out of a job soon. Yeah, we, we are needed. We are definitely needed. So in the early days of your journey, I really experimented a lot around with this combination of, uh, let's say, some sort of surreal or strange element and something that is very common and, 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 and normal for us. So th doing things like a hairy villa, Le Corbusier house made of Kobe beef, a new Pyrenees etching, a scaly house, a house made of feathers, a brutalist villa in the Alps. And one of the things I learned very early on is that I thought the, the results are much more interesting if I do not use particular architects or style names. Then things really start to become quite interesting. Uh, it, it's harder to, to, to create images that uh, are well-informed, well-rounded, and depict something that is understandable without using stylistic uh, terminologies or names, but at the same time, the results, if you get them, are far more rewarding. Also very early started using the, the, the doing the sort of tectonic facade studies that became super popular. And again, the topic of variations, we already talked about this. So th there are certain versions of mid journey that are really fantastic when you find the right tweak in your, in your, um, in your prompt, because of course you can use more than just language. There are shortcuts um, that allow you to manipulate the imagery a little bit more, like uh, image weight, uh, the, uh, the, the, the format of the image, um, the, uh, the, the way how it actually values different parts of the prompt. Uh, it gives different weight to different parts of the prompt. So there's some, some tricks and, and things that we can do to, to achieve uh, more precise results. I'm, I think I'm going to jump over my mushroom houses here and also the rooftop remodeling in Vienna and go back again to this image uh, to, to again emphasize um, the value of the idea of estrangement and defamiliarization in this whole context of design. I think that's what it can really help us to push uh, not only architecture from the terms of aesthetics, but really from our understanding of what uh, architecture represents for us as humans. I just wanted to show you also this one because it's just amazing. This is the newest version uh, of Midjourney creating again sections. And the sections I have become so incredibly detailed and 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 uh, uh, very compelling. But there's still the same problem going on that I mentioned before. Because of the lack of semantic information in the data sets, these sections do not make a lot of sense. But they can again help humans to be inspired or provoked or, or triggered uh, to respond to this and, and you know, start to take that change that around, cut it up, put it back together and say, 
and, and find a way of how to use, for example, circulation in an alternative way, or finding ideas about the u spatial uses that we were not thinking about, that, that this um, machine shows us, and is, is, it, might, it might be wrong, right, in the first look, but inspires us to do something right. So how do we do all those things then in 3D? Because of course, there's always this, the question of, okay, this is a lot of images, but we are architects, we need 3D models, right? Which is also something that I have debated occasionally, um, basically saying that the Albertian paradigm, which allows us to think about the folding of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface and then unfolding it back into three-dimensionality, is probably one of the biggest achievements we ever, ever made in our discipline. So the flat two-dimensional surface has a value, but um, thinking about, it's still interesting to, to think about how to do a 3D model out of them. There's a variety of... Um, of techniques out there at the moment, um, including things we have done in the past, like uh, really creating 3D GANs uh, based on 3D, 3D model data sets. This here is a little bit of a different approach. Um, we basically used uh, a, a project um, in Vienna, uh, right quite at the center in one of the most famous shopping streets there, the Mahilferstraße, which is a combination between uh, shopping and an office and we created a data set of um, brutalist buildings. We trained that uh, to give us uh, results, resulting images that are present actually in the latent space between known data points. And what uh, what neural style transfer? Uh, what neural? Sorry, what style gun does? Sorry, was wrong there. What style gun does is that it basically um, interpolates between the known data points and uh, starts to show us things in that Latin space that we didn't see before. And then uh, we used uh, pixel projection, selected a couple of those images from the Latin space, and then used pixel projection to create a 3D model out of them. And it's what you see here. And it's quite surprising the amount of detail and elements that this process can, can give you. However, it is still necessary to model a lot by hand when you get the result. So it's not a process that will give you automatically everything resolved and perfect. You still have to add staircases, elevators, floor plates, detailing, uh, facade elements, uh, um, glazing, uh, uh, frames for the glazing, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things were done sort of like a post-processing of the model that we got uh, uh, from the from the um, technique that I just showed before. All that you see here, all these floor plates and, and stairs and so on, those were all elements that were additionally modeled to get the project really complete. So it, it was also possible to present it to the client. And then, um, the Deep House is a, a, a newer a newer commission that came in a couple of months ago. Uh, it was quite an interesting commission. Um, this is from a neuro, neuro, neurologist in Austria who has a site somewhere between um, or exactly at the border between Tyrol and Salzburg in the Alps, very rugged space, rugged terrain. And he wants to build a house there, sort of like a weekend house for him and his family. But he had one, and he had, he, the reason why he commissioned us was because he saw that we are working with methods which basically um, emerge from neuroscience, which is his field of interrogation. And he wanted a house that basically represents uh, his discipline. But he also had one very particular demand, is that the house has to be a mid-century modern house. So we said, no problem. Uh, we put together a data set of a uh, couple of thousands of examples of facades from mid-century modern houses, then trained it, uh, created uh, the, the same story like with the previous project. Um, we selected images from the Latin space and then created a, a pixel projection out of it, which generated the model. Uh, and then um, we basically used almost everything that we got out of this process to really create the program within the house. 
this is the house in that rugged terrain that I talked before. Um, it has a, a pool that uh, slides into the inside. Um, it has like a, it actually fulfills the whole program that he wanted uh, to be in the house. I'm particularly fond of the ceiling that we got out of this process. Uh, it, it, at the same time, it's very practical and, and gives us stability and all the things we need. But because it's cut, cut it up, it has also those uh, slots where daylight comes through that large um, roof. And then I, I also emphasize that despite the fact that we used a modern data set, the result very often contradicts what modernists would have done. Uh, in that it consists also of elements that not necessarily have a purely functional aspect to them, but also a purely aesthetical one. Like, for example, this um, this division wall between the exterior and one of the sleeping rooms for the kids. And that's the last project that I wanted to show in terms of how we are using AI to really come to a conclusion um, of a project. I want to add that uh, I'm also the co-founder of the Neural Architecture Group, together with Daniel Borlochan, Immanuel Co, and Sandra Manninger. It's a group of architects that includes that regularly meets and discusses um, the progress of AI in architecture. And because things are moving very, very fast, those meetings happen quite often. Uh, it's incredible the pace that we're seeing these days in terms of the development of AI tools. Then there's the website AIarchitects.org. Uh, which collects uh, various positions, also people that are not necessarily core members of the Neural Architecture Group. So right now we're really looking into this, this emerging um, field of interrogation in architecture, and we're trying to collect them on one website. And uh, as, as, uh, as Vasim mentioned at the very beginning, I'm also the founder of the Aril Laboratory. That's how you spell it, by the way, the, pronounce it, by the way, it's Aril. The two is silence silent. Uh, the Ari Laboratory, which um, is uh, a collaboration between architecture, computer science, robotics, and data science. And this is also the laboratory where we explore more pragmatic problems uh, in terms of the use of AI and architecture. For example, aspects of automatic plan generation or optimization of floor plans, uh, but also the application of 3D model data sets to create housing projects and a variety of other uh, projects that I, that I cannot really or, or not allowed to talk about yet, uh, but you will probably hear about them rather sooner than later. And then there is the a YouTube channel, Remeshing-AI, which, um, uh, which com uh, combines and collects, uh, for example, lectures that I do on AI, but also has a set of tutorials about the use of Python uh, and PyTorch and other methods, also how to use Google Colab and so on, to, int to introduce people of how to get into using uh, AI uh, algorithms uh, outside of uh, very user-friendly things like uh, mid-journey. And so this entire lecture I said is based on the book Neural Architecture, Design and Artificial Intelligence, which was published with Oro uh, about a month ago. And further readings, if you're interested, uh, Machine Hallucinations, Architecture and Artificial Intelligence, which I co-edited uh, with Neil Leach, came out April this year. And in later in December, there's going to be this book out, uh, Architecture in the Age of Intelligent Machines by Springer, which is sort of dependent uh, to the Neural Architecture book in that the, architect, the Neural Architecture book is rather a book that focuses on uh, uh, aesthetics and aesthetic ethics and the theory behind using AI and architecture. Uh, this one is the opposite. It is the technical manual with the code, uh, the mathematics behind it, and the explanation of how these algorithms actually came to be. And with this, I would like to say thank you very much uh, for the generous invitation. I'm really happy that I had the opportunity to talk to you. And with this, I'm going to give back to Basim. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. I think that was that was that was quite quite interesting, quite provocative as well. Um, for the uh, for our attendees, I mean, we have about seventy participants, sixty nine participants uh, online. So, if you would like to ask a question, I'm assuming you have a bit of time, Matthias, to uh, take some questions. Uh, please yes. put in the Q and A. I believe there's, uh, there's we already have one from Kamal, which I will get to uh, in a second. Um, 
But um, if I may, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask my questions before before I forget it, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, first of all, thank you for a very good presentation. Uh, you had mentioned that neural architecture is truly the first 21st century uh, design method, and that is, I mean, definitely a, a provocative statement. Uh, in we all as architects kind of know what design methods are and you know, we classify them and we follow certain schools of thought on them. And we also apply them um, in different stages of the design. So certain design methods are more appropriate for certain stages of, of certain, you know, of, of your journey through, through architecture. So I would like you to uh, explain that a little bit further um, and try to place you know, I'm going to call it neural architecture, but because obviously, you know, it's much more nuanced than that. If you would like to separate it into you know, different categories, because your work has um, has gone, you know, before mid journey and and now, you know, through mid journey and after mid journey. So there's there's uh, different aspects of neural architecture that you have you have dealt with. Um, can you place it in the context of uh, an architect? you know, doing a, a design, uh, you know, a design project of some sort, and also perhaps um, the types of uh, architectural programs that this is suitable and not suitable for. Mm. Okay. Know, we that will uh, obviously very well to do clients that can spend the money on on that kind of architecture. Where does where does this apply and does not apply? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and when you, when you mean programmed, you mean um, like building types, building programs, Typology, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, typologies, yes. So the, the interesting thing is that um, because this whole development is not a style, it can be applied pretty much to anything that you want to, provided you have the data to do it. So if you, for example, we are working on, on, on apartment plans, right? Um, and we're trying to get people to from all over the world to collect these plants and annotate them and so on, because we're interested in creating a possibility to optimize apartment plants, for example, for social housing. Yeah, uh, but you can do the same with office spaces. If you have enough data about office spaces, you 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 should be able to optimize the way how offices work, for example, uh, or hospital plans, or you know, it, it's it's really dependent on how much data you can get and how to train a machine to, to, to help you make decisions on those plans, or even maybe save you time in generating those. Yeah. I'm not even sure if they're, if they're currently able to give you like the best possible solution, but I know that it can give you variations of ideas that are really good and that you as a designer then can take those and run with them or change them to your, to how you want them to be. But it's not dependent of program, and it's not dependent on. Or, 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 I mean, the the other part of your question is is sort of like how expensive is it to do, right? That was the question. Um, it it really depends on how good your network is, because what my 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 lesson that I took from computer science, yeah, is that they share absolutely everything, yeah because they hope that somebody can take what they worked on and make it better. So they publish a paper about a new process that they developed to, to have a better machine vision for cars, for example. Somebody picks it up and says, hmm, that's an interesting approach. But actually, if I take this data set instead of that one, I can improve it and make the, the next paper, right? And we architects have, have unfortunately the tendency to keep things to ourselves, yeah? Uh, we always are afraid that somebody's going to copy me and somebody's going to take my idea, uh, blah, blah, blah. That times are over, if you ask me. Yeah. So if we start sharing, yeah, if we start sharing plans, if we start sharing models, if we start sharing uh, information on a far higher level, that allows us as architects to, to develop these ideas further in better quality because then the data is out there. But do you know how difficult this is, it is these days to get plans of airports, for example. It's impossible. Yeah. So we cannot we cannot use AI to improve airports, but we can use it for things that are out there, like apartment plans. Thank you. I mean I was I was intrigued by by the comment you made on the villa that even though the source material is all mid-century modernist, the result is not. 
Yeah. So in a way, you have to also be intelligent about the data set that you're using to get the final result that you are aiming for, because it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. It's not a it's not a sampling process. It's not no. saying here are some you know ten mid-century villas, pick one or pick you know a combination. Uh, it's not even a true interpolation. I mean, you did mention the latent walk and that the fact it's interpolation, but the the, the things that are in, in the middle that are interpolated are actually not A and not B. Uh, in yes, a way. exactly. It's a very new thing. Uh, I, have, I have compared it a couple of times already to a telescope or a microscope. Uh, basically, the, the, when you take two data points and you interpolate between those, yeah, whatever is between those data points is something that already existed before, but we were, we were not able to see it. Right. Yeah? So that's why it's sort of a microscope. It allows us to look into, into areas of interrogation about design that we didn't see. They, they sometimes look new to us, despite the fact that they're probably not. Yeah. Uh, this is, for example, what happened with the, with the mid-century mid modern data set. It, there's definitely features that the machine learned and started to reproduce in the design we got ultimately. Yeah. But, uh, but they're different enough to, to, to stand on its own. Yeah, yeah perfect. Uh, I will I will jump to the Q and A's that we have uh, online already. So I'll start with Kamal, who was student is is a student here. Uh, question one: uh, What are your remarks on the large number of users who have started identifying themselves as AI artist designers just by writing phrases in tools like Midjourney and OpenAI Dali too? Yeah, I mean that's. I, I think you know the answer already. Yeah. That's why you asked the question, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the the honestly, this is uh, a couple of months ago. I was saying that I think it's it's just a it's it's a hype, yeah. So there's gonna be like thousands of people who are gonna suddenly say that they're like AI architects or artists or, or, or so, yeah. But it's probably also de going to decline again, yeah, because people are gonna get bored by it. Yeah. And I actually am looking forward to that. You know why? Because if 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 let's say ten thousand are sorry. If 10,000 architects picked up Mid Journey, yeah, to play around with it and are fascinated, and some of them are gonna call themselves AI architects or whatever, yeah. If after a year, I tell you, a year from now, yeah, from these 10,000 architects, there's gonna be only a thousand left who are still gonna continue working on that problem, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we have a thousand architects debating a little bit more earnest what it means to use AI in architecture, we have a great debate. That's gonna be good. For architecture. I mean, honestly speaking, I'm happy about uh, the, the rise of Midjourney because it's the first AI tool that was massively adopted now by uh, artists and architects and so on, maybe giving them for the first time the possibility to work with an AI tool that they didn't know before how to use. Yeah. So for, for, for what I try to say in architecture uh, in terms of AI, it's, it's, a good, it's a good development. It's a great development. Great, thank you. Um, I will I will jump to other people's questions, and then if we have time, we'll come back to Kamal's mm -hmm. second question. Just to be fair, uh, from Benjamin, uh, where do you see AI applied in urban design context to make uh, urban urban design decisions? That's also a great one, and and one of my favorites actually. Um, some of our earliest work with AI was basically just using satellite images of cities and making style transfer between cities or between landscapes and cities. Which of course, I mean, uh, same to the to the to the mid journey imagery. They are not really well informed. They don't have any semantic information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but they look just great. They're gorgeous, yeah. Uh, and that's sometimes the first step towards interrogating those deeper and, and understanding. Well, they look good, but what do they mean? Uh, do they do they really provide you know a, a more interesting urban um, uh, texture and so on? And this is what I mean by this sort of this this kind of work. Um, just to make it clear. Yes, it can absolutely be used to make urban design decisions, but to do this, there is some work necessary, and that that goes again into dataset building, semantic information inclusion, like all this, all the nitty gritty and boring stuff you need to do when you're using AI and architecture. But once you have done that, you can, with a with very good point, say yes, this is something that will create a better city. And the good thing about that is that every every sort of AI application, yeah is based on data, right? And the good thing is, is there's tons of data out there for cities, yeah? 
from the energy consumption to how the lights work on a on a crossing to the the the, the proportion between green space and built space. So we have like enormous amounts of data about these things. Yeah, the more with data we have, the better. You just need to be clever enough to understand what do I want the machine to learn, and what is this supposed to generate when I want to make an an urban design decision. Yeah, do I want it to create an interesting and uh, a functioning, well designed road system? Yeah, which is based on pedestrians instead of cars, maybe. Yeah, uh, how does the public transportation work in such a city? You can take like the data out there about thousands of examples of public transportation in cities and try to optimize that. Yeah. So yes, absolutely. You can definitely use it for urban design. Great. Thank you. Um, question. I'll try to paraphrase it because I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand it fully. He says, uh, I'm an architect, how to turn myself into an AI architect, which again, I'm, I chuckle at that, at the term AI architect, but maybe that will catch on. Um, where I do not have any courses during my studies. I, I, I'm assuming, uh, I'm, I'll just gonna try, try to paraphrase it, that the current you know, programs that we are all looking at, you know, experiencing uh, in academia, probably are not even touching on that subject. Um, and we are, we're lucky enough to have speakers like you to come and, and give us talks on that, but obviously it's not in you know, part and parcel of the curriculum sometimes. Uh, so I guess you, uh, a comment on, whether you have, you know, especially maybe give us the case of Michigan, are you introducing courses that are specific in that area? And what do you see yeah. around the world, perhaps? Where should people go? So it's 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 starting. I can see that. So um, we started offering seminars and thesis projects based on AI uh, about four years ago. And they, they're incredibly popular, by the way. I mean, students really respond to this. Um, and um, specifically the seminars are very often in collaboration with computer science. So we have, for example, computer science um, 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 uh, graduates, not the graduates, but rather the, um, the well, grad level, uh, graduate level students coming over to our studios to teach our students for example how to how to code and how to you know how to basically come up with a or how to code a let's say a style transfer yeah um and by now i think that it has become so much easier because when we started i don't think there was google google collab yet out but now with google collab it has become so easy to find some algorithm that does something similar to what you want and then tweak it so that it serves an architectural purpose. And to be able to do this, like the first thing you need to do is to learn Python. And there is actually very good, very good free Python courses out there now that take a student maybe two, three weeks to go through. And after these two, three weeks that he has enough knowledge to be able to tweak and change things in a code. It, I'm not even asking to code from scratch, just to be able to look into a Google call up and say, okay, if I change this here, it will connect to my data set instead of the data set that is actually currently connected to. Like simple things, but they're good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that I was I was laughing because I insist that my my students learn uh, Python. It's, it's one of yeah. the required uh, modules. To, good. Without, good. Yeah. Without, without it, we cannot move forward. Yeah. Um, very, very quickly. I know we're running out of time, so I will. I'll try to see if I can squeeze these last two questions in. Uh, from Abdul, uh, uh, who was my, he was my PhD student. Uh, could you please elaborate more about what parameters you use to train the machine learning? Did you get, did you give the machine learning images to mimic the design? In particular, he's talking about uh, the project that has a relationship to the ground, the one we use in the poster. Um, yes. Could you speak a little bit more about that? I mean, this one was was a, a mid-journey result. So there, there's a there's a couple of things that you can manipulate in mid-journey quite well. So it's mid-journey just not does not only take uh, text as uh, as input. By now, for example, you can even use images as an input. But more importantly, there's a bunch of small commands that uh, that are in the manual of mid-journey, and it's maybe like three dozen commands. It's not a lot, yeah that allow you to manipulate certain things in the image, particularly the image weight or the weights in the prompt. So you can say, let's say, um, a villa in the Alps, um, colon, colon, five, 
um, uh, at sunset, column column two, and it will emphasize the villa rather than the sunset. So it can you can you can manipulate really the the, the 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 different weights in the sentence very particularly. Mm -hmm. You can you can play of course with the image weights themselves. Uh, this is almost oh, it's, it's, uh, it's in dash 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 iw for image weight. Uh, but um, to keep it short, there's like a whole series of those commands that allow you basically to tweak the results in a in a particular direction. Yeah. Uh, they, in the meantime, they also have things like dash dash chaos. So it, it, to to add more craziness to an image, so to speak. Yeah. So you can do all these sort of things there. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, I will have to limit it to one more, one last question uh, from Marco Sosa. Uh, he, it's more of a comment, but maybe you can, uh, you know, feedback on that comment. He says, thank you, Matthias. It's great to see you in action. I have been following your work for a while. Just a comment following your answer. True AI is still at a very embryonic stage. It's still learning how to take a breath, never mind crawl or walk. And I think AI still needs to mature majorly. AI systems is a learning process. It's usually in fashion at the moment, but true AI still needs more data input and processing time before it becomes of age. Um, let, me, let me put a question, especially on that last thing. How would we recognize what he is calling true AI? What is, what is still, what in your mind still missing for us to reach this true AI that uh, is mentioned? I think a true AI would be able to generate an original thought because that's profoundly human. It's not possible to copy that yet through through uh, through AI. Um, so, if an AI is able to to create something that is profoundly new and surprising and different, that would be for me one sign of of of, uh, of let's say a true AI. If it's actually able to be really creative on its own, that would be an that would be also a sign of true AI. I don't think that AI is creative, by the way, today, like. We actually we interpret it creatively what comes out. Um, so anything that goes comes closer to to consciousness. And the problem we have with AI at the moment is that concepts like consciousness or uh, awareness, well, no, awareness is wrong, but certainly consciousness are things that we cannot explain entirely uh, through neuroscience. We don't know exactly how this works. Same, by the way, with creativity. We cannot explain through neuroscience how creativity works. And because we don't know those things, we cannot encapsulate them in math to create an algorithm that can do that. So once we understand more about us, we might be able to create a real AI. Fantastic. On that note, uh, I would like to thank you again for joining us this afternoon and best wishes with your work. Thanks, thanks, again. thanks a lot for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.